Hi everyone. Okay, we can go? Okay. Hi. Thank you, thank you. I, I haven't said anything, so that's uh, flattering. Um, uh, thank you, Big Panda, for hosting uh, the meetup. It's, it's nice to be uh, having these meetups after so much time. Uh, this is a great company to work with. I haven't worked with in this office, but I worked, worked at Big Panda a few years before. It's an awesome company. Um, and uh, thank you, Dor, for a great talk about algebraic abstractions. I liked it. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to you about a library for writing concurrent and asynchronous applications called ZIO. Um, we'll do like two minutes of background uh, about why ZIO is necessary when you already have things like future and stuff like that. Then we'll do an overview of ZIO. Now ZIO is a huge library. It was written in one year, um, but it's, it's incredibly huge. So we'll try to um, do this really compactly and, and somewhat thoroughly, um, it, it's, it won't be complete. And then we'll do um, like, uh, not live coding, because I'm not brave enough for live coding. Um, we'll do uh, a whole example of doing something like MapReduce with uh, ZIO over local files. Um, do feel free to stop me if you have any questions, because this is like a really code heavy uh, presentation. And um, it, it might be kind of fairly easy to lose me, so uh, feel free to ask questions and stop me during the presentation. Um, I'd, I'd rather like uh, go over time or, or cut in the middle, but have you with me. Um, so about me, I'm, I'm Itamar. Uh, I haven't introduced myself. I'm Itamar Ravid. I'm a freelance software developer here in Israel. Um, I'm doing functional programming, uh, microservices, DevOps, Kubernetes, what have you, um, um, for companies um, around here. Um, I co-organize this uh, meetup. Haven't done a lot <laughs> last year, but, uh, but uh, I do. Uh, and I'm, a I'm part of the uh, maintainer team for ZIO and ZIO Streams and ZIO Kafka, an upcoming library for interoperating between ZIO Streams and, and Kafka. It's gonna be really cool. Um, okay, so let's start with why should we care about ZIO? So to be actually useful, any program has to do some I.O. I mean, pure functions are great. I'm, I'm a big fan of functional programming. Um, pure functions are, are great, but without doing any sort of I.O., any sort of side effects, um, a program cannot be useful. Right? You have to print something to the screen, you have to display something. Can't be useful without doing any sort of I.O. Now, these days, um, to actually be efficient, a program you're writing, um, I mean, server software, definitely, other kind of programs, maybe, um, definitely has to use some sort of asynchronicity, right? We can't write an HTTP server and have it be scalable and um, handle requests synchronously. We can't block threads, we can't do th stuff like that and expect our software to be scalable. So to be any, to have any sort of efficiency in our program, use our resources efficiently, cut our, our cloud uh, provider bills down, we have to use asynchronicity. Um, and to be fast, to actually saturate the servers that we're using and use all of our cores, um, we probably should use some form of concurrency. Now, maybe you'd say, well, I can run my Node.js applications, just run like four processes and, uh, and, and do stuff like that and have my Kubernetes run uh, four pods and whatnot. But usually to be actually fast, the program has to use several cores, have to, it has to use concurrency, and um, that's the way you gotta do it. All right, so Scala's answer to these requirements so far has been um, it's called concurrent future. So a future is a data type that represents a running computation that will at some point in the future end with a result of T or, a, or an exception or a failure, a throw. So future, um, um, to, uh, to do asynchronicity, future doesn't block your thread. So if you do something like this, I've got this computation called background running in the background. It's blocking a thread in the background, but it doesn't block the calling thread. So the thread running this computation right here is not blocked, and I'll get to this print line um, probably before um, this uh, print line has run. 
right? So future doesn't block your thread. That's great. Um, future also lets you do things concurrently. So if I've got two um, CPU bound computations, I've got more than one core in my server, um, then I can run two of these computations in the background. Um, future submits them to a thread pool in the background. Um, and I can zip the two computations together to get a future that represents the end result of each computation. And I'll be using two cores concurrently in this um, computation right here. All right, so future lets us do things concurrently. That's great too. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so what are the problems with future? So one thing is that future is eager. What does eager mean? So let's consider um, this function, which um, tries to fetch a user from a database and falls back to a replica database if the main database is not available. So this right here, this line, will be launching one computation called main request. And when we write, when we execute this line, the other request is already running, right? So if the main request fails, I'm recovering with the fallback request. But if, even if the main request succeeded, I've already sent another request to my replica database, even if I did not need it, right? This, this, this request right here, um, sorry, this request right here, it, it, it didn't actually need to run if the main request succeeded. And that's the problem with future being eager. You have to reason about um, whether your futures have, are defined with val or with def or with lazy val or whatnot. All right, does this make sense? Fallback res request should not have run if main request succeeded. Now, um, another, another problem with the future is that you can't actually cancel running futures. So if I've got um, um, another sort of uh, multi-master configuration for my database, and I'm trying to fetch the user from the first um, database that succeeded in answering, um, even though I'm using this combinator called first completed of, and um, um, I'm yielding the, the first computation that succeeded, the few future that succeeded, both of them will still, will still run completely to their end until the database has responded. Um, in case, for some unknown reason, the second uh, request has not started before um, the first request has succeeded, it'll still run, it'll still waste resources, um, so, and we can cancel it. Right, so in this example right here, both requests will run to completion even if one of them succeeded before the other. All right, so that's the second example that where future is not good enough. If you understand both, you cancel the future, how, how do you know what return, what's the return? Well, if one request succeeded, I'd expect all the rest to be canceled. Okay, so those get user is a future so Yeah, yeah, sorry about that, yeah. Feel free to ask, to ask these sort of questions if, if the type signatures are, are not um, clear. Um, so these are two of the problems that Zio is here to solve. And um, let's see what, what Zio is actually all about. So Zio is a data type with three type parameters, right? It's got a Zio, uh, a Zio has a type parameter R which describes what environment does this Zio need to actually work. It's got an error type, which represents how this ZIO might fail. And it's got a value type that represents what value this ZIO will yield. So in other words, um, a program with the type ZIO REA is a description of a program, it's just a description, it's not actually running, just a description of a program that requires an environment of type R to run, and when it will run, it may fail with an E or yield a value of type A. All right, so that's pretty abstract. More concretely, let's say we've got a program that requires an environment of type config, it requires a configuration to run. When this program will run, it may fail with an app error, with a domain specific error that you've defined, and it'll end successfully, or not successfully, it ends successfully with a string. So another way you could look at, at it is like a lazy future that 
doesn't necessarily fail with a throwable. It may fail with your own user-defined error. And it's a purely functional description for asynchronous and concurrent programs. So this program may use multiple threads. It may use concurrency. It may use asynchronicity. All these features that we want for modern applications. And another way to look at this is that, that this program is kind of like a function sorry, from config to either of app error or string. That's kind of a way to look at it, um, but except the fact that computing this may require additional effects. We call it additional threads, additional cores, or not. All right, so how do we actually create programs with ZIO? So we've got a few constructors that are um, necessary. So the first constructor is how you create a program that yields a constant value that has already been computed. So the zio.succeed of 42 is a program that has already been computed and will just yield that 42. And this, uh, these two constructors are more interesting. So zio effect total means this program will never fail, but it represents a, a description that hasn't been computed yet. So this program is a description of a program that will compute the fourth Fibonacci number. All right? It will compute it synchronously. It will do it on, on your main thread. But it hasn't been run yet. It's just a description of a program that will do that. And this constructor right here, zio.effect, is the main constructor that we'll use for actually capturing um, IO computation. So zio.effect of read lines of this file is a description of a program that when it will run, um, it will um, execute some I.O. and read the lines of this file. Now, it is very instructive with Zio to look at the type signatures. So um, for these programs, for the constant program, you can see that it requires an environment of any. Any on the environment type means it requires no environment. It doesn't care about which environment you'll give it. And it may fail with a nothing. And if you, um, if you, if you know nothing, then you'll know that um, nothing is a type in Scala that has no value. You can't actually create a value of type nothing. So this means this program cannot fail because it cannot create a, va a value of type nothing. All right? Now, similarly, never fails um, is, has the same type signature. It doesn't reflect the fact that it is suspended, but it has the same type signature, so we know it doesn't need any environment, and it will never fail because it's, it has a nothing in the E. And may fail is more interesting because um, it has a throwable in the E type parameter. So we know, just by looking at this type signature, that this program may fail with a throwable, or it will yield a, a list of string. All right? OK. Um, we have a few adapters for um, adapting other values to ZIO. So we've got from try that can lift any try value in Scala Util try to ZIO, and, and you'll know that it correctly uses throwable for the error type parameter. And we've got either, which lifts an either to, um, to ZIO, and it moves the left of either to the E and the right of either to the value. And most interestingly, and very useful for interop with legacy libraries, we've got um, a from future combinator. So let's say we've got a legacy library um, that requires an implicit execution context um, called load user, which loads a user from whatever, returns a future of option of user. Um, then the from future combinator on Zio will give you a, an execution context you can use to adapt your futures. And you can use it to call your library and lift that future up into Zio um, without actually running it. That just captures the, um, the, 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 the fact that you've um, called a legacy library um, to, uh, to, to, uh, with, with, with Zio's uh, implicit execution context, with Zio's internal execution context. Right? So that's very useful for interop with legacy, uh, legacy code. All right. So um, as you might expect, um, Zio has um, transformations available on it, like future. So you can map the value yielded by a Zio. So if you've got a Zio of user, you can map the value type. So for example, to extract the name. Or you can flat map a Zio to chain 
additional com zero returning computations. So you can construct whole programs by using flat map. And by having these two functions, um, you can use four comprehensions with zero, just like you can use with future. All right? Um, interestingly, because we have an error type parameter, we need some transformations that operate directly on it. So um, similarly to map, we have the map error um, transformation, which can uh, apply a function to the error type parameter of zero. And um, we've got the either combinator that um, moves the error from the error type parameter into the value type um, and packages up in, in an either. And you'll note that by running either, we've changed the computation from returning a throwable to returning nothing. So you know by running either that your computation will not fail, at least not in this way. All right? This is a very powerful way of reasoning um, because you don't actually, in most cases, you don't actually need to read the implementation of the function to know what you're about or what you can do with it by using zeal. This is something you don't get with future. You have, um, there, there is no way you can be guaranteed that a future will not fail, All right? Unless you directly apply recover with or something like that to future. Um, um, future does not re reflect that, reflect this in the types. All right? Okay. Um, there are some more um, um, useful combinators. We can also use catch all to um, um, fall back to another ZIO if we, um, if, if we encounter an error. So in this case, we'll run um, the, we we'll yield a none if, uh, if uh, the user computation fails. And we've got fold which is kind of similar to uh, either's fold, which lets you um, specify how you'd like to handle each, uh, each case of error or um, success and folding them both to a common type. And note that all of these, um, they all eliminate the error type from the IO. Now, um, um, chaining two ZIOs with different error types automatically widens the error type of the composed ZIO. So for example, say we've got an app error um, um, data type that may either be an auth error or a database error. Um, and we've got two functions, each returning um, a, an individual um, type from this uh, fa type family. Um, when we chain two computations um, using these two error types, um, will be, uh, the, the, the composed error type will be automatically widened to app error, all right? You don't need to annotate anything. You don't need to, um, to, to help the compiler. Um, in most cases, um, like literally 90% of the cases, you don't need to help the compiler. Um, most cases will just widen automatically together. And um, even more um, exciting is that when Dottie or Skull3 comes out, we'll be using union types for the error type parameter, which will be even more ergonomic um, for these, but that's, that's the future. Um, all right, so that's great for, for, uh, for uh, ergonomics. And it's, it's pretty interesting to, to consider Zio's error model because um, this, is, this is, for example, a scenario that most effect monads and, and, and future do not faithfully represent. So say we've got um, two computations, we, we need to fetch two users, and we know what happens if one of them fails. We'll get like a, uh, a, a future uh, that has failed of with whichever one of them, probably the first error that we encounter. Um, but what happens when both of them fail? So this combinator, zip par from Zio, this runs two computations in parallel, all right? Or we'll launch two um, threads or two fibers, we'll get to that. And we'll compute these two um, computations in parallel. And if both of them fail, um, with Zio, we get a, um, a, a data type that faithfully represents exactly what happened. So we don't get, just get one failure, one exception. We get both, right? We get a failure for, uh, for the first one and the second one. So we get a very complete description of what happened, which is very um, valuable for debugging, um, you know, things that happen in production. Um, so 
just to, uh, to dive more into this, into Z or Zero model, so a ZIO of REA may either, may either succeed with an A, or it may fail with something called a cause of E. All right, this data type cause represents how a ZIO may fail. So a ZIO may fail with an E, that's, we've, we've seen that, we know that. Um, but an interesting thing is that on the JVM, it is possible to throw exceptions anywhere. It's possible to hit a stack overflow exception or an out of memory error or what have you. It's possible to hit these errors at any point. So a ZIO is faithful in that regard. It, will tell, it, it may fail with a throwable, a dial throwable. So uh, even if you have a computation that has a nothing in the type parameter and you're working with some legacy library that throws exceptions um, in places you did not, did not expect them and you did not suspend them properly, you may fail with a die. We call that a defect and we have some combinators to, to work with that. And um, a, a ZIO may, be, may fail with an interruption and we'll talk about interruption in, in a few moments. Now, um, how do defects happen? Well, here's some um, code that you may, um, you may encounter in, uh, in your libraries. Um, this is a, um, a task. We haven't talked about that. We'll see that in a moment. A task is a sort of ZIO. This is a ZIO that captures a computation doing some IO, and it's mapping the result. And for some reason, it is throwing an exception inside map. Now, this is illegal illegal in, uh, in purely functional code. You do not throw exceptions in, in bare, unsuspended um, thunks of code. So this right here is called a defect. And a DIO running this code will fail with a, uh, with a cause of die. All right? Will fail with a defect. Um, so, um, and finally, cause not only represents these direct um, causes of, of failure, it also, it also can represent composite um, failures. Um, for example, our zip par um, scenario from before will fail with a both, with both failures. And we also have some scenarios where, uh, where then is also necessary, but we'll get to that maybe later. All right, so several combinators in ZIO will let us expose the full, um, the full cause. So we've got the sandbox combinator, which is very useful for running code that you might not trust, or for example, running code um, for an HTTP handler. So you'd like the whole server to survive if, even if handling a, a specific request fails for some reason. So you've got the sandbox combinator, which exposes the full cause, and you can, for example, inspect what happened to that, uh, to that uh, uh, request. Um, We've also got fold cause M, which is like fold, but allows you to handle the full cause for ZIO, for, for, the, for the folded ZIO. And we've got the, the, probably the most powerful combinator of them all called run, which um, runs a ZIO in, a, um, in, in, in an isolated fiber. It's called a fiber, we'll see, see that in a moment. And it gives you the full, um, the, the, the full uh, exit uh, result. And exit is um, uh, um, the, the actual data type representing either a cause or a, success, or, or a successful uh, result. Um, so you've got combinators to handle all of these scenarios and, and you've got like very, very expressive power in your hands when you're using DIO. Now, um, we've got some very helpful type aliases for working with ZIO because ZIO is a very big uh, type. It's kind of tiring to keep writing it on and on. So we've got UIO, unfailable IO, which means um, that this is a ZIO that may never fail unless it's, it, it may fail with defect. An IO of EA, which is a ZIO that requires no environment. A task which is a, probably the most common um, type as you, you're going to use that um, requires no environment and may fail with a throwable or yield an A. And finally, we've got task, task R, which um, uh, describes a task that requires an envi environment of R. Um, all right, let's move on to concurrency and see how ZIO helps us um, create actual concurrent computations. So 
every sequential computation in the I.O., every for comprehension you chain, every flat map you, 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 you create, um, every sort of computation like that runs in a fiber. A fiber is, is not a thread, it's a lightweight thread. You can have millions of, of fibers um, running in your ZIO runtime. And a fiber um, can be kind of compared to an actor in Akka, if you know that. Um, so every computation in ZIO runs in a fiber. And you can explicitly um, move computations to background fibers by using the fork combinator. So if I've got a heavy, a heavy computation right here, I can use fork to say that this computation, um, when executed, will move a, another computation to the background and give me a handle to that computation running in the background. So right here, I'm getting a fiber that I can do stuff with it. It's kind of like a thread, right? I can join a thread, I can interrupt a thread. A fiber is kind of similar. I can do other stuff while this computation is running and then I can join it. I can say, okay, let's bring that back Let's bring this computation back into, the, into this uh, fiber and um, share our, our, our result. If this fiber fails, uh, I'll fail too. If this fiber succeeds, I'll succeed too. All right, so that's very explicit. You can move things to the background. Um, uh, the, the pretty cool thing about fibers is that you can immediately interrupt them at any point. All right, so if I've got a heavy computation running in the background and I've got some sort of function that decides if I need to continue running it, but I, it, this function may take a while to run and I'd like to earn that time and run the computation eagerly in the background, then I can, um, if, if, I sh if I should stop, I can immediately interrupt that fiber and it'll stop running at any point it is running and it will stop consuming resources. And that's pretty powerful because um, this is something you don't get with um, other, uh, with future, all right? Um, when do fibers actually get interrupted? Because you may, you may ask yourself, well, if I've got a, 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 a fiber running a while true loop, will that stop or, or won't it? Well, um, fibers can stop in between flat maps, in between steps of your full comprehension. Um, so if you've got a, like a, a, a step of your form comprehension that is running that infinite loop, that won't stop right there um, if you don't do anything special. That's, the, that's a fact on the JVM. But you have um, constructors in, in ZIO, which we won't see here because we don't have the time. Uh, you have constructors in ZIO that help you create cancelable computations so you can interrupt, you can create a, a ZIO that holds a while true loop and interrupts it. That's possible. All right, well, we won't see that here. Now, um, when you're um, operating under, under fine grade cancellation, um, proper resource management is very, uh, very important to avoid leaking uh, resources. So in this, um, in this example right here, we're opening a file, reading some, fi reading some lines out of it, and closing it. But let's say I get interrupted right here before I can close the file handler. So if this is a server that is running computations and maybe it's timing them out for some reason, um, over time I'll be leaking file descriptors on this, on this server. And that's not good, right? This is, this is server software that will crash eventually, right? We don't want that. So um, ZIO gives us a, a, uh, a, a contract called bracket. So bracket is kind of like try with resources. Uh, from Java or try catch finally in some sort of way. Um, so this bracket right here says open a file, um, guarantee that this cleanup handler will run and use that file inside this block right here. And each one of these returns an, another ZIO. So this creates like a, 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 uh, a prelude and a, a, a body and a, and a, and a, and a what you know, how do you call it? And a finally, like a clause um, that is guaranteed to run um, without leaking any resources. And this is pretty important. Now, how does it, does it actually work? So here's our, our bracket um, hand drawn. Um, so what bracket will do is that it will run the uh, resource acquisition and the release uninterruptedly. It won't let anything interrupt them. And it gives us the guarantee that this cleanup handler will always execute. All right? So if 
we get into this body, and this body may be interruptible. We don't want the body to be uninterruptible because that may um, 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 use too much resources, or, or we can't time that out. Um, so if this uh, body succeeds or um, in, gets interrupted at any point, we have the guarantee that this cleanup handler will always execute. All right, that's bracket. Now, what happens when we want to uh, acquire multiple resources? So we've got our Redis connection, and we've got our MySQL connection, and we've got the um, Elastic, uh, Elasticsearch connection, and you can see where this is going. Um, so the problem with brackets is that they, they do not compose properly. So obviously we have a solution for that in ZIO, otherwise I wouldn't be putting up this meme. Um, it's called ZManaged. It's a, a container for a resource that can be acquired and closed. And we can compose these ZManaged um, values together using flat maps or forward comprehensions to create composite resources that will run all the acquisitions and all the cleanups in reverse order when used. And this is how we use a resource. So we've got the composite resource and we um, call the use function and get, that, get all the acquired resources in this body. It's like, kind of like a curry bracket, you, know, you can think of it. Now, if this looks um, obscure, I, I had a talk about that, so you can um, watch it. Um, um, and that's, a bit, that's it for ZMATS. It's a super powerful data type and super useful data type. Most of, my, most of the services I create um, are just like big flat maps of ZManaged. It's probably the most useful data type I've seen. Um, and our whole streaming library is actually, um, in ZIO, is actually based on ZMatch. How, uh, how do you compose it? Is that, is that there? After you oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, right. So, ZMatch.make will let you um, lift up an acquisition and a release uh, ZIO to, to ZMatch. And we've got the ZMatch from effect that lets you um, turn a ZIO into ZMatch. Um, um, and, and I could show some yeah. other stuff later. All right. Uh, okay. Who's written a function for exponential backoff? We're trying before. All right. Yeah, that's, that's common. I've written so much times before, <laughs> can't count. Um, so this is a function that will um, do exponential backoff retries with ZIO. It's horrible, right? That's not fun to write. So um, we're starting with a zero counter. If we're failing and it's a max attempt, we fail. Otherwise, we retry with a delay. Yeah, not fun. Um, uh, one thing that's common about um, back off, exponential backoff is that everyone has their sort of version. Some, some of us like, like it with a jitter. Some of us like it bounded up to uh, some sort of maximum delay or maximum attempts. Everyone's got their own um, like home cooked cooked version of exponential backoff. And the annoying thing about writing um, exponential backoff like this is that if you want to add another feature like add jitter, you have to change the actual function, right? You, you gotta um, um, like add more and more, t more and more parameters to this function. It gets big. No one understands what it does. Got lots of default parameters. Not fun. All right. So ZIO um, reduces this uh, this big function to this. This is how you do exponential backoff with ZIO. You've got a schedule that is exponential with a base delay of 50 milliseconds that is jittered, and it will bound itself at five retries, five attempts. This is how you do exponential backoff with ZIO. This is super powerful. All right, this is one of my favorite ZIO features. Um, we can um, create schedules that use environments. We haven't talked at all about environments in this talk. We won't have the time, unfortunately. Um, these sort of schedules consume values of type A. So they may be um, errors in, in the case of retries or just values in the case of repetitions. Um, and they compute some sort of delay and a type B, an output. So for example, a recurring, a recurring schedule that will, as an output, output the number of times it has repeated. All right, so you can get that sort of feedback, that sort of very uh, important production, um, um, production information from your schedules. And we can compose schedules together using intersection. So this schedule that we've in intersected will repeat for as long as both schedules 
would like to repeat. This schedule will always repeat for as long as, as, as there's a fiber right here will fail to. Right, so promise is a very cool signal you can use to transfer um, information between fibers. Uh, we've also got REF, which is the uh, pure version of uh, Java atomic, uh, con um, atomic reference. Um, it's a purely functional um, 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 mutable variable we can use to store information between fibers. So this fiber right here will every second increment this, uh, this ref right here and will sleep on the main fiber and then get the, uh, the counter and we can see that it, it got, probably got to five if we run this. So ref is like the version of, uh, pure, pure, pure version of atomic reference. Um, we've also got a very high performance lock free concurrent queue you can use to transfer information between fibers. It's got multiple strategies for handling overflow. You can back pressure, you can drop the head, drop the tail, um, fail. Multiple strategies for doing something like that. So the, the interface is pretty, pretty simple. You can either offer a, an element and it'll never fail because it's a UAO, uh, or take an element. And here's, for example, a fiber copying elements between queues. So we've got an input queue and an output queue and we're offering a multiple elements to the queue. We've got a fiber here um, continuously using forever, continuously taking elements and um, offering them to the output queue. And um, we'll sleep for one second and then interrupt that fiber and then take everything in that queue and see what's inside. All right, so our AQ is super, super, super uh, useful for constructing your concurrent applications. Um, and it's very fast too. Uh, we've got a semaphore, which is very useful for limiting um, access to a resource. So for example, you wouldn't want to um, um, run an expensive computation too, um, with too much uh, parallelism. You're accessing a database or something you'd like to protect. So you've got the semaphore, which has, um, for example, in this example, 10 permits, and you're protecting this computation by acquiring a permit before it runs and releasing it when it ends, even if it fails. Um, and then this right here will run the expensive computations with only 10 um, concurrent um, runs. All right, that's a stem for. Now, um, using these, um, these constructs, just because they're purely functional does not mean you can, um, you, you, it's harder to make mistakes. It's, it's pretty easy to make mistakes, pretty easy to create deadlocks. So um, it's not every day that you need to use these constructs. Um, they're pretty low level. Um, Zio has some alternatives in the form of STM. That's um, uh, software transactional memory. We won't discuss it here, but it's, it's pretty easier to use and reason about. And many times streams are easier to use than these um, these um, primitives, um, but they're available if you need them. Um, by the way, the, the previous uh, thing that we wrote is even easier to write using the collect all par n, which will run a computation up to um, n up, up to n times in parallel uh, without using semaphore, without using anything. All right. Um, lastly, last feature before the the the, the example, um, Zio has. Um, very, very cool feature called as asynchronous traces. Um, say you've got a future um, co based computation running two HTTP calls and you're zipping them together and one of them fails and you're wondering which one failed in production. The exception you're going to see for future is this. Uh, it's kind of hard to see but the word um, Google uh, sorry, the word first or second does not actually appear in the stack trace here. Just the word HTTP call. So you have no idea which one of them failed. And you're um, up to the mercy of the production gods to run your application again. Hope it will fail after you've added some logs. Um, ZIO gives you much more information. Um, this is the stack trace, uh, stack trace you'll be getting with ZIO. You'll get the regular stack trace for your exception and you'll get um, the execution trace for your fiber, all right? Where it start, where, which functions it visited, even though they were asynchronous and they crossed threads and they crossed asynchronous boundaries, you'll get that information. And you'll also know what was the future going to be, 
what it was going to continue to, what's the next instruction it was going to, uh, to execute. So you're getting that out of the box with, no, with zero configuration, just by logging your errors. This is what you get with ZIO and it's super, super, super useful. All right, any questions? Okay, uh, let's see a full example. MapReduce, everyone's favorite, favorite example. So what we're going to do, we're going to list files in a directory um, and queue all the paths into a queue, create several wor worker fibers, not four, and um, dequeue the paths from the queue and count the words. All right, so that's word count. It's a pretty common example. So the first uh, thing we're going to do is um, list files in a directory. All right, we'll um, get all the, the paths in the directory, list the files, get an iterator, convert it to a list, done. This is a good example of the um, environment type parameter, which uh, requires a blocking capability. So just by using effect blocking, you're saying I need the ability to run blocking computations on this, um, on this uh, uh, computation. Um, another blocking IO effect is, that is reading the contents of the file. So once we've got a path, we can read its contents into a string. All right. That's pretty simple. We're just um, taking computations, effectful computations, and wrapping them in effect blogging. Next, um, we'd like to put these two together. So we're taking all the paths, and we're using ZO for each, which runs a effectful computation over a list and gathers all, re all the results. Oh, okay, so ZO for each will read the contents of each file sequentially. Um, split it, split, split the string, um, take the size, and sum all the counts together. Now this is doing, yeah. So if you want, like, if you have thousands of files and you want to stop them in the middle, you can't break them, right? Because it stops in between the. Uh, what do you mean stop them in the middle? Like interrupt this round. The uh, actually, if I just write dot fork here. I move that into a fiber in the background, and then instead of counts, I get a fiber that I can do uh, like additional uh, logic and then interrupt it if I choose to, right? Just by doing dot fork here. Okay, so actually making this for, uh, map reduce um, requires some additional abstraction. So we're um, moving out some of the specific logic, like uh, splitting the the string and uh, counting the uh, the words. So what we've done here is make this an actual map reduce kind of like thing. We're taking a string, making, um, mapping it to an A, and then folding over the, uh, over the A's and moving them to B's, all right? So our count all words is map reduce over our directory and then splitting the string and then summing all the counts together. Right, so if we'd like to do this in parallel and not sequentially, because zero for each runs sequentially, it runs over every element, one after the other, um, we can use uh, for each par n, we've seen collect all par n before, for each par n, we'll spawn um, workers, an, uh, n number of workers um, to process all the list. All right, that's all you need to do concurrency, simple concurrency in ZIO. Now, um, um, yeah, it's it's kind of the same as fork, um, but it uses a, a semaphore to internally limit the number of, of, of workers actually executing the body. So we won't have more than workers running at the same time. So permits for the semaphore? Sorry? So workers are permits for the semaphore? Uh, yeah, workers are permits for the semaphore, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, now. Let's do some more abstraction because we'd like to set this up for continuous directory monitoring. We, we'd like to um, get an updated count every time we, uh, we add a file to the, uh, to the directory. So what we're doing here is that we're creating a map worker, a worker that will read elements, I'm sorry you can't see, elements from this queue, read paths, and apply the, pa apply the paths, apply the map function to the path, and um, and move the, the result to the reduce queue. So what we're doing is taking a path, reading the contents, running the map function, and moving that to the reduce queue. So we've got two queues and some workers moving between them. And now we've got our reduce worker. That does something kind of similar. It um, takes a, a count from the, from the input queue. It um, 
grabs the, um, the latest B it has seen from this ref right here, and it runs the reduce function over the B and the A, and moves that, uh, the, the output to the output queue. Right? And this does this forever in the background. Now, we just need to launch everything, and uh, this, is this is really uh, kind of boilerplate code, but it's required. We need to launch all the map fibers, launch the reduce fiber, and then wait for, for all of them. This code will be available in the, in the gist after the talk. Now, um, this doesn't really use anything new. You've all seen, you've, you've seen the, uh, the primitives we're using here. In the stock, we're using collect all, which is kind of like future.sequence, and we're using join all, which waits for all the fibers to exit. Um, and after that, we need something to print the intermediate results. So we're taking things continuously from the output queue and printing them using forever.fork in the background. And this is our application. Right? We construct three queues, we list all the files, we uh, offer them to the input queue run our map reduce in the background, run our printer in the background, and wait for the printer to exit. And this is all you need to do map reduce in ZIO over um, files in a directory in parallel using on a, on a local machine. That's about, I say, less than 100 lines of code. That's pretty expressive. Um, okay, that's it. Any questions? So, uh, in the example, you showed the converting a future to a Zio. Right. So the Zio from uh, future. And uh, there's uh, an implicit uh, in context being given. Yeah. Now, two questions. One, is it safe to ignore this execution context and use my own? Yeah, it is. Okay. And <coughs> well, well, you need to, keep, to take into account that the your own execution context is the res is the resource pool you'll you'll be using. So if you're running blocking I/O, you need to know that. Exactly. You know? That's why I want I want to have uh, an I/O bound uh, uh, yeah. and a CPU bound and right. use my own. Right. So Zio gives you a, this configuration of the box, and you can extract the um, the blocking execution context from Zio if you'd like to run things explicitly on it. I can show you that later. Um, but you can also use your own if you're managing it in a legacy app. So that's my second part. So <coughs> the environment is actually determining the, the, which thread pool is, uh, is it running on? It's one of the things the environment can tell you. It tells you which resources this ZIO computation is going to access, is which ZIO not, not going to access, which ZIO which resources it requires to run. So if you, um, if you see a ZIO with blocking in the R type parameter, you need to provide it with the blocking capability. Um, it's like, it takes about half an hour to talk about it, but uh, we, we don't have the time for that. There are, I, there, there are uh, there's a good talk by John about that. Okay, right? well, mostly I'm interested in how to integrate Xyro with, you know, uh, regular right. and right. Akka and stuff. Right, that's totally possible. One, um, um, I'm running services in one company using Akka Streams and ZIO. So it's totally possible. Okay, great, right. thanks. Right. Yeah. Uh, Let's say I'm a, I'm a big Cactus Final fan, uh. and, my, uh, <laughs> and all my app is running with sync.delay, and right now I'm using Cats.io. Yeah. Can I, yes. do I have to do work to make no. that No, we have the interop Cats model, which gives you instances for, uh, yeah. for Cats effect uh, um, concurrent effect, uh, and all these type classes, and, uh, and you can just switch out Cats.io for zero by importing the right instances. You should not be using <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's it, but we haven't covered so many things. Um, um, the R type parameter, um, we haven't seen how that can be used to replace things like tagless final and uh, dependency injection and give you very uh, cool and testable implementations. And we haven't seen STM, which is a super easy way to construct concurrent applications, and fiber local variables, which, which can help you throw out thread local variables out of the window. And of course, my favorite part, ZStreams, ZO streams, uh, ZO's, ZO's streaming module. Um, um, so we, we don't have the time to talk about that, unfortunately, maybe on future meetup. Um, but if you're interested to learn more, so um, hop on zo.dev, that's our website. 
and we've got the, uh, the GitHub repository, so you can post issues if you're having problems. And um, we're very responsible, re responsive on, on the Gitter channel, so feel free to hop on and ask any questions. Um, I know several people have done that. Uh, and of course, we've, we've got John DeGos, the creator of the library, coming to uh, Israel to teach workshop, a three-day workshop at Zio, graciously hosted by Iron Source in September. So grab that. Um, tickets are launched. There are 30 spots. Um, uh, everyone who buys first wins. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, hope you, uh, I hope you'll join us. It'll be very cool, very useful for everyone. All right, any other questions? You all buying tickets? <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right, that's it. Thank you.